uh, the Buddha said, um, make your backbone straight like a pile of coins. He didn't say, make it curved, you know, with a lumbar curve. So many meditators, well, I'm just, this is something from, you know, my own experience, which may not apply to anyone. But so many strive for a curved back, you know, the lumbar curve, as if you're in a car with one of those seats that makes your your spine curve. And uh, the book <laughs> says, straight like a pile of coins. And a pile of coins does not curve. It's straight. And when I started implementing that, um, my sitting got a lot better. And so this chair you see, I don't know if you can see it, you can't see it, has an absolutely straight back. It doesn't accommodate curves. Um, so unless I slump myself, uh, it's straight. So when I'm forced to buy something with a curved back, I, I make up for it with other cushions that I strap into the back. Um, Actually, when I did that, I was, I was making that lumbar curve, which is uh, against my own system. You know, sharing experiences sometimes help, sometimes do just the opposite. Back problems are so many and various. Yes, so... Um, the book that I sent is the fourth volume in my series on Songaba's The Essence of Eloquence. Uh, the first volume is Tsongkhapa's General Introduction, which is written, I don't know whether to say mainly or entirely, from the viewpoint of the Consequence School. Um, so the introduction is not just to the first chapter, which is on the mind only school. The book itself is has three chapters. Mind only school, autonomy school and consequence school. The introduction to the whole book is from the point of view of the consequence school. That's what said um that's what said. Why well, I hesitated, uh, because <laughs> as soon as I started to say it, I wondered if anything in that general introduction is just from the point of view of the mind only school, which I didn't check today because I didn't know I was going to say this. <laughs> um, so that was the introduction and the mind only school was the first volume and then uh, Tsongkhapa being as great as he was inspired all sorts of people to write more about what he had written. 
Uh, one could say, partly because he wasn't as clear as they thought they could make him, make what he had written. They thought they could make what he had written clearer. Especially on the, I would say especially on the Mind Only School. One, I mean, if I put on my Gelukpa hat, one could even, or if I took off my Gelukpa hat, one could use words like, uh, there's a good deal of confusion on certain central topics in what he wrote on the Mind Only School, and this attracted some very brilliant Tibetans from all parts of Tibet to try to work out what Tsongkhapa meant or what he should have meant. within the context of pretending <laughs> that this was what he meant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and really, as some outsiders get fooled by the pretension, as if they're, <laughs> they're just repeating what he said. And they're not at all just repeating what he said. Uh, either they're bringing a great deal more clarity to what he said, or they're adding a great deal to what he did say in order to work out some problems in what he said. And the latter is why there are some quite, shall we say, quite strong disagreements among Gilukpa writers about what he, shall we say, meant or should have meant. Really strong disagreements. And thus, and I got involved in, or shall we say even obsessed, in <laughs> giving a little <laughs> uh, commentary on my own work, um, in trying to figure out what these various writers were putting forward and it was a delicious in many ways delicious obsession and because of one of my students John Powers and his interest in what the Korean scholar who came to China and uh, I don't know if he ever returned to Korea. His Korean name is Wanchuk. In Chinese, something like Yuanze, and in Tibetan, Wainze. He wrote a huge text in Chinese on the Sutra Unraveling the Thought, which is the basis of the mind only section of Tsongkhapa's text uh, and how to understand it. Uh, and this was translated into Tibetan, which uh, Tsongkhapa read, well, which on which there's a, 
a long commentary. Um, and Tsongkhapa, of course, poured himself into uh, understanding that text also. In any case, there's a great deal to write on, and thus I put together two, two volumes. One giving a general exposition uh, on what Tsongkhapa and many of these others were saying, and then a third, the third volume being uh, a complex, a delving into the complex issues themselves, which could be labeled more than you ever wanted to know. <laughs> Uh, Bill McGee, whom many of you know, um, read every page in, you know, in detail on his own. I taught the, the, all of these volumes in uh, seminars in Virginia, and which helped greatly in in at least my working out of uh, what uh, these scholars were saying. I forget how many of these many texts were I read, and fortunately I, I read many, many of them, and that's why I said I became obsessed. And I wrote, as I read them, I wrote down a great deal. And I say that that was my fortune uh, because later I discovered a, sent a text um, that both His Holiness and I came to, I suppose I could even say revere, as the best of all of these. And as I remember, Jigme Tamsha Gyatso and Amdoa. A lot was a lot of many of these texts are written in Amdo. Um, Revere as the best of all of them. I think he looked into some 46 of these texts. Uh, mine, I can't remember, I think I have 26, and I, th I think I used around 20 in uh, my. Uh, three volumes. Um, he said there was one youngish Tibetan scholar, really, well, I, well, okay, I won't say anything. Shall I call him very intelligent? I was going to refrain from saying that. But you can, I'll now, I'll stop with this final sentence. And you'll see why I call him very intelligent. He, he uh, speaks and reads English. And he praised me for what I have written in these volumes. He said, I read your translation, which has notes right at the bottom of the page, the first volume. And he said, it actually has meaning. Most of us Tibetans, when we read the Tibetan, cannot understand anything. In other words, when I read the English, with I guess he meant with the some notes that are with it, I didn't say that, it had meaning. <laughs> so you can see, that's why I called him intelligent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, let, let me tell you, 
I well, I'll add. <laughs> I fully agree about reading the Tibetan and not getting any meaning. That's why people wrote so many texts. So many, you know, once they got into it, they wanted to make it clearer. Um, Ladi, Jun, Ladi Jun, Junchu Tsotrim, whom we know as Ladi Ramache, um, since in our publications we don't use words like Geshe and Rinpoche, we have to find out people's real names. Ladi Junchu Tsotrim. He was abbot of Shadze when I went there to continue working with him. He said that His Holiness was likely coming to Ganden to teach this as the essence of eloquence. And so I asked him if he had a copy of the text I could start reading on my own. And uh, I started reading it and I couldn't make any sense out of it. And uh, outside, um, Betsy and I were staying in the then Schatze guest house, and, uh, which is, you know, at that time, this is way back, which is, well, it was a totally adequate place. It was right on the border with uh, uh, Jiangzi. And uh, so I don't know where this monk was from, but at night, he, from memory, was shouting some text. And it turned out to be this text. You know, as I was lying in bed, oh, I could, oh, yeah, that's like Shen <laughs> It's quite a coincidence he was shouting it. So, of course, you would shout it. And why not? You know, with vigor. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I was trying to read this text, and of course I would understand some things, but basically I couldn't understand it. So I thought, well, my way of getting into an understanding, Bob Thurman had already translated the text, and uh, but uh, I thought, well, my way of getting into a text is to translate it. So um, I lay... I've told this story before, so for those who have heard it before, I'll just bore you a little. I lay on my bed with my, uh, you know, tape recorder on my chest and dictated a translation. And that's how I got into the text and, and, and uh, went on and on and on throughout my stay in India and went through and translated the entire text. And I'm still, I'm still working on it, yet to bring out the section on the autonomy school. So it's called the essence of eloquence, and uh, this name, essence of eloquence, is used by some persons, but not by Tsongkhapa here, um, as a way of complementing one's own text. Uh, there is a tradition in Tibet of using a title that complements your own text. My text has an essence of eloquence. What I what I have written is eloquent, and ha you know it's essentially eloquent. Uh, has an essence of eloquence, or uh, you can give as a title of your text that it contains the essence of eloquence. Eloquence is the word of the Buddha. And the essence is emptiness. And uh, Tsongkhapa does not begin his text by saying, look here, uh, the eloquence <laughs> means Buddha's word, sutra and tantra, sutra and mantra, but sutra and tantra. Uh, and the essence is emptiness. But um, Tibetan scholars have noticed that in a shorter of uh, one of Tsongkhapa's texts, 
call the praise of dependent arising and somewhere essence of eloquence comes into it. I think toward the end, Tsongba himself uses the term essence of eloquence and explains it. And there's another source within Tsongba's writing. And the essence of why is emptiness the essence of all of Buddha's teaching in sutra and mantra? Because when you meditate on it, you develop the qualities, the qualities of a superior, of someone who have who has risen above the common state, and you develop the qualities of course combined with the practice of compassion, of omniscience, which puts you in a position of being able to help others. So, this is uh, the title announces the content of the book. So these are various systems, mind only, the autonomy school and the um, consequence school on the topic of emptiness, which will uh, serve as a means for differentiating what is, this is a bit too brief, but what, how they go about determining what um, among Buddha's sayings require interpretation and what are definitive. Now this, having finished what I'm going to write about on the Tsongba section on the general introduction in the Mind Only School, uh, this volume begins my translation, what comes before chapter 5, is the translation of the general introduction to the middle way school, which I also call just the middle school. The reason why I call it the middle way school is not to call it way meaning path, but as His Holiness said to me way early on um, in, must be 1972, the middle way things are. And thus there is a justification for translating it. He had noticed this translation in that rather than way here meaning middle path, but just middle, middle way things are. But uh, a uh, perhaps more literal translation would be the middle school. Uh, <laughs> of course, any term one uses in most places, this might, you know, make us feel the middle school before high school. Does that come before high school? It's just like, trans, you know, the, the Mother Perfection of Wisdom Sutras might make one, you know, reminiscent of, oh, the mother in the Catholic school. Is that right? But you use these terms enough with their meaning and you, you forget about Catholic school and you f forget about middle school. What is the middle school, seventh grade and eighth grade? For those people who have never heard of the middle school or Mother Superior, <laughs> this is called backwards teaching, talking about things you don't need to talk about. <laughs> so I'm not afraid of using terms that have other contexts. Because, you know, we make our own context. Use them enough, and you'll forget about the other one. Or even if you can't forget about it, you'll realize, well, you know, nobody owns the term. <laughs> yeah. 
So anyway, um, in this fifth chapter, um, uh, I'm using Tsongba's writings in his earlier book, The Great Exposition of the Stages of the Path to Enlightenment, to flesh out um, state, a couple of statements that he makes in The Essence of Eloquence. And his uh, statements in The Great Exposition of the Stages of the Path to Highest Enlightenment, there being three enlightenments, those of hearers, solitary realizers, and Buddhas, so the thus highest enlightenment. Um, I forget why I began <laughs> the sentence. I started a sentence and thought, oh, I should explain why there, why it's enlightenments. So, in looking at, I read the, yesterday, read the, I was drawn into reading this chapter yesterday and I thought, oh, well, we can, we've actually, this group read this entire chapter as well as the sixth chapter uh, before we diverted to reading a whole lot of other things and I thought we could read it very quickly and so forth. But when I was reading it this morning, I thought we better read this slowly. <laughs> now that we have more background, and if we find uh, that it's boring, we already know all this. <laughs> but anyway, yes, you know what I mean. We'll see how it goes. Now, the compatibility in the third line, the compatibility of emptiness and dependent arising, compatibility of emptiness and dependent arising uh, means the compatibility of the understanding of emptiness and the understanding of dependent arising. That the understanding of the one promotes understanding of the other. And it works both ways. And sometimes, so, sometimes Tsongkhapa speaks of it, you know, with understanding of emptiness, promoting understanding of dependent rising, you know, and sometimes understanding of dependent arising, promoting understanding of emptiness. Clearly it works from his own wording of it, it works both ways. Hmm. So, there are those who assert that phenomena are not empty of inherent existence. So, that doesn't just mean non-Buddhists, it means Buddhists. And it means Swatantrakas, I mean autonomous, middle way autonomous. I mean inherent existence is so attractive. It's not some absurd position about phenomena that any sane person would reject it. Proponents of mind only are not insane. It doesn't mean that things exist so much in and of themselves that they don't depend on causes and conditions. It means they exist enough so that they could depend on causes and conditions, according to these folks. 
if they didn't have this much existence, they couldn't depend on anything, you see? If they didn't exist a little from their own side, they couldn't depend on anything. They would be figments of the imagination. So they accuse consequentialists of being proponents of nihilism. Do you say nihilism or nihilism? Or sometimes both? Either. One, uh, either or either. <laughs> I do both. I'm not both in the same sentence. Ha, ha, ha. Nihilism, nihilism. Nihil, nothing. You folks have gone too far. In the descriptions that many, you know, persons who teach and propound the consequent school begins to look like that. As if there's nothing there. It's just, just <laughs> nothing. Whatever you want to think. <laughs>